Welcome, everyone. And thank you for coming to uh, the next event in the 2021-2022 Capla School of Architecture uh, lecture in the event series. My name is Oscar Lopez, senior lecturer in the College of Architecture. I'm also part of the event committee, joined with our current chair, Beth Weinstein, Professor Beth Weinstein, Bob Perkins, and uh, Alfredo Quesada and Howie Lessinger. And we're going to start with uh, land acknowledgement, which I'll read here. And I'm going to then turn it over. <clears throat> the University of Arizona occupies and is built upon the land and territories of indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. And we are honored to work on the traditional lands of the Tohono O'odham Nation and the Pasque Yaqui tribe. On behalf of Capla, I pay my respects to these communities and their elders past and present. Aligning with the university core values of a diverse and inclusive community, we recognize and acknowledge the people, culture, and history that make up our community, and we are proactively working to broaden awareness throughout campus to ensure our students, staff, faculty, and guests feel and are represented and valued. At Capital, we are pleased to be gathered creative and creative thinkers and makers of the built environments from nearby as well as places far away to share their thoughts and work with our students, faculty, staff, alumni, and other friends whenever they, wherever they may be. Before introducing um, the, our lecture, our speaker, our next event is March 23rd, where we're going to be uh, joined by uh, Professor Arlie, uh, Arlie Atkins for the next talk as part of the series, uh, presenting the criticality of context, centering the socioculture and planning and urban design. Also, you can find more of our events on the Capital website the, under the events page. And now I invite my colleague, Jesus Robles, who's going to introduce today's speaker. Thank you. And then, presentation three. I'll introduce a quick presentation three. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Oscar and Beth and the committee. Um, I'd be honored to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Uh, Ernst Peter Flusinger, or affectionately known as Upe, um, is an architect practicing in Lubbock, Texas. He's also a professor of architecture at Texas Tech University um, and is currently serving as interim dean. He's worked for several studios uh, in Switzerland, including Mario Bota, and he obtained his master's from Virginia Tech and worked in an office, uh, in the office of David Rockwell in New York, before moving to a teaching, for a teaching opportunity in West Texas. His design and research shows a wide range of interests from economical, ecological housing, minimalism in architecture, design build processes, and the reason which I think he said he moved to Lubbock was for the work of Donald Judd in the proximity of Martha, Texas, which we'll see a little bit about tonight. His work has been published in the New York Times. His book, How Much House, pardon me, um, Thoreau, Le Corbusier, and the Sustainable Cabin explores ideas of nature, excess, efficiency, and the essentials of what to dwell in the West Texas landscape. The second edition of Donald Judd Architecture in Martha, Texas was just released this year. Um, I can share with you guys endearingly uh, that his teaching, that his approach to teaching, practice, uh, and how he navigates between the profession and the discipline has left uh, an indelible impression on me. And I can probably speak for Kate, my other half, that does that there might be no dust for me standing here today if it wasn't for this uh, professor here. So, as a graduate student, I was fortunate to land a position. Doing some of his research. Um, I quickly learned from him that the experience and observation of the world, the environment around us, is crucial to imagining space. I learned a little more of that from him this morning on our trip to San Javier Mission. I also learned that when opportunities arise, one should try really hard not to squander those opportunities. I remember fondly a, a story really quick that Uwe shared of how he obtained his position in Bota Studios. He would frequent this cafe that he and Mario Bota would go to for about a year. 
to position himself in a seat, maybe in the gaze of, of Mariupolka, and who is sketching his sketchbook repeatedly. <laughs> and this, over time, I think it was a year duration, eventually led to Mariupolka stopping asking to see his sketchbook and landing him a position in his studio. This story for me is something hard to find in this sort of day and age of virtual reality, social media. It's something inspiring. His architectural pedigree, I think his undeniable Swiss perspective and his roots. Uh, building his family home in, home in Lubbock and his fondness for West Texas for access to the land, the great big sky, Judd, endless roads uh, for him to ride his BMW motorcycle, have been an inspiration for me on how to forge your own path in architecture. So I'm fortunate and grateful to call him my mentor, a friend, and I'm very much looking forward to this evening. Please extend a warm welcome to our guest this evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm humbled to be here. Thank you, Jesus, for this kind introduction. I want to thank the lecture and events committee, Beth Weinstein. Oscar, who just made the setup, and then in general to be here in Tucson, it feels a bit like coming home. Uh, every so often I come here or give these kind of weird talks. But I'm also mindful of the studio. I was visiting there twice, so Christopher Domini, thank you very much. It was just a pleasure to visit your students. And in the end, that's why we are here, because if it would not be for the students, none of us would be here. And if the students just among themselves, they still can teach something to themselves. Uh, but we, without students, we can't do anything. And uh, also, Oscar, for reading the land acknowledgement, um, mindful from that, coming from the uh, Mescalero and Comanche tribes from the East. So it is true what Jesus pointed out. This is the copy of the first edition of uh, Donald Chad, and as naive it might sound, but it is. And that's why I moved to Lubbock, Texas, because it was the closest accredited architecture program to Marfa. Now there is a second program, it's closer than Lubbock, Texas. It's in El Paso, and it's actually Texas Tech. Two plus two year program from community colleges to get a four year bachelor's of science in architecture, and then they come to Texas Tech. So. Anyway, that's a closer school now, but uh, this is the second edition, and I'm ex incredibly humbled for many reasons. This edition has to wait, but um, what I want to say is like if you have a chance to revisit your old work, it sort of gives you a chance to rethink it. And uh, in this academic year, Kapla has become that opportunity, and I think it's a gift as every day of this life is. And, it makes me move because I can re-articulate of what I felt earlier or for most of my life, professional life in the United States. So here what you see is what Donald Chad is known for. So um, most people don't know him as an architect, but know him as an artist. And this is probably his most quintessential work. Anybody or most people are a little bit interested in art know it's so-called stack. This is the very first. Uh, it's a very unusual one, but actually I like it a lot because it has this American quality of industrial material. It's galvanized iron, as you see, and this one is seven uh, only, and usually has an even number, and the idea is that you basically have it from floor to ceiling, no matter where you have it. This was exhibited in Rio Castelli's gallery first, and now it's only in Europe. The only time I've seen it is not in Sweden, actually at the MoMA show uh, two years ago. But what you can see, the integral part here is that the space in itself is always integrator. Integrator of Chad's work, no matter what he does. And um, there's a variation of themes. Sometimes he uses industrial acrylic. He actually uses the brand of plexiglass. And this one is in stainless steel. 
And this is him at work. So he here is probably around 1970. This is in the first floor of New York. It's 101 Spring Street, the intersection of Mercer and Spring Street. And you can actually see that it's worth noting it. Uh, Judd is in the foreground there. Please note that in the back, he always had to have his work surrounded by himself to understand how it affected. But basically, uh, he bought this entire building for $68,000. It had five floors and five, uh, two basements. This is what it looked just before pandemic, before the big church opening for the MoMA show. What you see here is actually the same desk you just saw before. That's the very same desk he's leaning on. The reason I'm showing that is also I'm basically going to make an introduction because of the theme, as I was told from Christopher and also Beth, was it is a metaphysics of light. And of course, as when you study someone's work for quite a, some time, you're going to go look at what that person wrote about light. So I found out he wrote pretty much nothing about light. So the title here is Natural Light, which is probably because English is my fifth language, so bear with me and sometimes my uh, language or choices of words, but the light I'm really talking about in Judd's architecture is the light who enters without, say, the light you're using right now. And basically what you're doing here, you're looking at light. So Judd himself in 1968, he bought that vast cast iron building. And I want to point out the neighbor building here, only a two-story building, probably somewhere from the 30s, I don't know, but something got pulled away. So it's one of the few ones remaining. It's now actually in a beautiful condition. It's restored in 2013. You can visit. Um, here, there is actually expanding it out, and there is actually a skylight, so sort of little glass blocks in the sidewalk to get natural light down into the basement. That's the site condition. And that's the building in 2017 when we actually measured it. So here it is already renovated. And you can see that this one has been filled up. Here the block has been completed. But this is basically how we came about and what actually many students, but including especially Jesus, was part of it. What we did is Don Chad at some point said just before his passing, it just actually was the 12th of uh, February this month in 1994. He said that everything should be preserved as he left it. And I go into that in a little bit. So I want you to look at the photography first because um, this is still film photography. I'm giving credit here to Paul Deberle. I actually tried to communicate, no, I communicate him with him multiple times. Um, I want you to look at certain areas here before the re uh, renovation here. For example, this area is a small loft. You actually can see a uh, bed up here. And you can also see the freestanding sort of uh, kitchen sink placed in the room. But this is a recent photography from 2017. And now you see that this here is actually a air conditioning. So what I'm trying to point out is, when we talk about light, just the way photography was made 30 years ago, uh, versus when we do it now, whether we have our cameras on our uh, cell phones, um, we see basically light and we see differently because on the film we have longer exposure times. I will talk about that. So the plans we established, now you can see the photography we took here. So anytime no credit is given, it's either done by myself or somebody from Texas Tech, including my student. So you see here that it was retrofitted for the artwork with air conditioning. No, Jeff didn't have that. But what's important to point out is that the way we photograph the light, today we photograph it differently. And while this is the renovated space, sort of approximately in the same position, we can see that the exposure times are longer. So when we think we look at the same thing, we don't really look at the same thing. But I really think it's keen to Judd's work that he was an extraordinary observer of light condition, even though he never wrote about it. Uh, the architectural decisions here he did, um, he has these two planes. 
And he actually inserted both new floors on this to create these two planes. And here you see the restored space. And you can actually see over here when we go back and forward. And I only found that out in the preparation, even though we measured it. But you can now see that there is a slight gap, which he didn't intend it to do when it was originally. It's just flush. And I'm sure you would have noticed. And it took me three years to notice in preparation to this lecture. Um, also, the artwork, uh, you can see this is Frank Stella. A piece here is missing. The foundation sold that. And then over here, also uh, Dan Flavin, probably his favorite artist. Zigzag chair by Gary Dreitfeld, and the other furniture is by Judd himself. So this, we arrived at the fifth floor here, and this is the first piece of furniture Judd built, basically the bed for his wife, Julie Finch, which was a dancer. And then we custom made this, and I want you to get a look at that light particular part here, how the light uh, looks like. Give me the color of those neon tools. One color is easy to identify. What color is it? Yes, right. Thank you for that. And the other one? Okay. White, maybe? All right. So it's actually blue. And the entire um, space in itself, you couldn't really photograph before. I want to say digital cameras, or you did some extensive darkroom work. So um, it's hard to talk about the color, but it is red and blue. And of course, you're familiar with that color scheme here in Arizona. So uh, when we look at the distance here, and this is the map in the beginning of the book, I will not talk much about the book, because I think what's more interesting is to say to talk to you what's not in the book, which makes it hopefully particular. But what you can see when you look at the United States, the continental United States, if you look at Texas, it's one third from east to west. So when we drive, actually, that this enormous distance is quite, uh, quite something. And in 1973, Donald Church decided to go to a place called Marfa, Texas, uh, which is founded as a railroad stop. And basically, that's a historical photograph. I will show you through a series of it. And it's interestingly, when we look at it, we have electric cars, we have combustion engine. And here in this photographs, you see horse buggies, cars, and a railroad. <laughs> so you basically have three systems. So if you think about it, now we're sort of in a transitional space. This is just what happened all the time. You know, the only thing consistent is change. This is circa 1940. Um, to the left is actually the Presidio. Uh, Marfa National Bank, owned now by the Chet Foundation. And here is the map of Marfa. This was before Google Earth. Uh, we drew that, and Jesus Robles is part of the original team making those drawings still in use. And if you know, well, why are we not perfectly north? But anytime you had to found a town, and it's founded as a water stop, and we had steam engine. What happened is that the town grid was perpendicular to the railroad track running through. That's exactly what happens here. So at the time, no more uh, train stations are uh, stopping there. But this is the Marfa grid. And here are the buildings. Uh, some of them we will look at it. I will rather talk about a few buildings, but specifically consider all the aspects of light or what I found out talking about light. If you ever go to Marfa, your first movement should be to go actually up here into the lantern. It's kind of like if you go to a church steeple uh, in Europe. You understand the European city, you go on the church steeple, you usually have access there called the cathedrals, medieval churches. Here you go on top of the camp, uh, courthouse and you can look down Island Avenue. Um, It seems Donald Chet saved everything. So he actually came through as a soldier when he was enlisted for the Korean War. He never came through Marfa, but he stopped in Van Horn with three other soldiers and sent a telegram to Mom, which you can read here. And from that moment on, he sort of touched into the Southwest, which he was interested. Um, there is the mountains, and that's that Chihuahuan High Desert. This is sort of a lighter moment here, but um, 
Uh, we think of Tomo Chetveli as a serious artist, but it changed dramatically since I stepped first to Marfa, which was in 1996 as a student being on scholarship from Virginia Tech. I learned about Chet's work even when I was in Switzerland and was fascinated about it. So it sort of becomes, I mean, those of you who are familiar with uh, John Walters, they know that he actually sort of makes a and makes fun, I have to say, of, of the work there. Well, you can see Donald Chet's bear. And um, this you may came across, if some of you, maybe many are on Instagram, but uh, here you can see the likes. This is Beyonce um, jumping in front of Dada Marfa. And if you Google, which I did in preparation of this lecture, if you Google Marfa, Texas, this is what the Google image page shows you. So here you go. And you have Prada Marfa first, and then here the first slide is actually a work of Chet. And those of you who actually have been there, it's actually in Valentine. It's not even in Marfa, you have to drive 30 miles. So if you really go by that, um, you don't see it. But what I'm trying to explain to you is that um, we think as architects that we must sometimes and I find myself in that fact that we're in the center of the universe, but what Beyonce says is way more important than any architect says on earth. And this man, I did not know, he stepped there in, uh, this is now the building we will examine it a little bit specially when it comes to light, but this is the Instagram of Kim Namjoon, better known as BTS, or better known also as uh, RM, which is his nickname for the Korean uh, rapper band. And I had no idea. When he posted that this past December, he had in one day 120,000 plus likes because he stepped there and took in those pictures. So what does that tell you? When we think about architecture, you know, we think like we're sort of part of this culture, but it looks like this all passed us and that actually social media communicates way faster and to many more. So, here is a Donald Chet quote that I want you to remind if you don't remember anything from this lecture, but I think this might be helpful because Chet used it himself. And this actually is nowhere to be found in a book except mine. I put it in the uh, work with the uh, research library in Austin, Texas. And this is literally while I was working on the afterwards uh, describing transcribing that particular lecture. It's now available if you choose so. But what it means like that, sort of, in a way, very, very precise, I mean, Jeff argues like, before you do anything, just look at the situation first. And then when we look at also in terms of light, as we look about the light, all we're receiving is our eyes is receiving light, right? We won't see anything when it is dark. So it also reminds me of some uh, uh, Hippocratic oath people take, right? When you're a doctor, do no harm. And in a way, we should apply that when we are working on architecture. So a little bit more about Jeff. This is a famous photography by Laura Wilson, who happens to be also the mother of the Wilson brothers. She was commissioned for work to take photographs of Donald Chad, who just came from the ranches. And the story goes something like that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to make yeah, this photo shoot with you, but he sort of had chest pain and he said, well, I took from that water tank, I took some water, I don't feel great. This is the last official photograph, late November in 1993, and in February 12th, in the following year, he passed. So he had lymphoma cancer. And by the way, he also never would see Marfa again. So what I'm trying to say here, in terms of when you look at the entire town and what he had yet exactly 20 years to produce what's there. But I think the architecture often is still misunderstood and I will now go to some key buildings and point out why I think that argument uh, and why do I make that argument. So if you have to comprehend or want to understand a bit more, you should start with the block. And it's also called La Manzana de Chinapi. One thing I forgot to say when I showed you that the stack, after about 1962, Church decided that every, every artwork he's ever going to produce is going to be untitled. So, no title, any association, nothing. And in architecture, it's actually almost the opposite. 
He says, Lamanzana de Chinati. And he says it's not based on Spanish, it's based more on the Catalan, and says manzana not with an Z, with an S. Those of you who know very Spanish tonight can correct me. But he says that in that very lecture. So here we have three main structures. This is what you find today, basically two military hangars, a two-story building to the very right, and a few smaller structures. Here is where I'm trying to go out. So, um, Oscar, if I might need help here, we found out that that I have to play directly here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, so you'll see just a quote if you'll also speak, if it works. It's the two-story building in the background. So the reason I'm showing you this is really it's a segment out of the Michael Blackwood movie to show you to get an impression of what the space felt in 1975. This is filmed in September. And what happens is basically that the place is completely dilapidated. Marfa itself is really at a low point. Um, the Anglo Ranch has no longer had the money they once had. And um, buildings are just sort of dilapidated, and um, very few things is going on. But it just first comes to Marfa in 71, rents a building, and then in 73, purchase what now referred as the block. Interestingly, where he exits now is roughly where you enter when you go to the block. So I'm going to stop when he says Arizona or why he's not in Arizona, but bear with me. This is now downtown Highland Avenue. Uh -huh. Like less people and more space, I guess. Okay, so he didn't say he came for the natural light. I, I, I really think he should have had that. But what I think what happened, and here is sort of the point when the lecture team came about the metaphysics of light. I am my understanding is that for Judd, like the sun, the stars, and the moon, light was just a given. He never discussed it in his work in particular except when he talked about color. So now let's get out of this, and I'm going to leave this alone. And I have Oscar doing his magic before I ruin something. Okay. Thank you very much. We weren't able to get the embedded video working, so here we are. So think about this being Judd's pickup truck I just showed you when he played around. This is the video angle or the camera angle of Michael Blackwood. And the red buildings are about what you're going to see in that sequence or what you have. So let's just examine that a little bit. That's the two story building. Here is the pickup truck you just saw. This is Judd in 73, photographed by Julie Finch. And I wanted you to know this of what is around when you look in the picture. So here is that photography, two different events, the movie. And here is where Chert is standing now. And the angle, that's the gold ball across the perimeter of the wall. So that's the total view of it. But think about 
1975, you really must have an incredible vision in order to go out there and say, okay, I'm seeing some high-end art and architecture being done here. So it's not about how expensive the spaces are, it's about the vision and the space of what I can do. And this is perhaps my fascination when it comes to the architecture of him. Pointed out that, especially on the materiality today, this is actually the plaster who falls off the adobe. Uh, this um, wall is, is gone, the sliding doors are gone, and he actually closed it with adobe after he moved the artwork in. So even if you try to think, oh, that's kind of low security there, but if you go try to steal a piece of artwork, <laughs> you won't get it past the door. <laughs> So I show you the before and after. This is what you now encounter. So that is literally from judge time. And now look at and orient yourself to today. By the way, about six years ago, they took that chimney down too. So it's no longer there. So here is where church would have stood just about. But this entire space is basically reorganized by Judd in my mind in a very good way. And the way we said it, basically, we didn't want it to have any meaning put to his work. So uh, we at Texas Tech basically felt like we make drawings of as he intended it to be and show the proportions that way. So by the way, this is Jesus here in the low corner measuring that very building right there. This is 2003. So thank you. So just looking at this particular building here, the two-story building, when you notice and we see, we see the drawing, this actually is a piece of artwork which is sloping. And he does that on purpose here, the inner uh, ring, and it's also serving as drainage uh, for the water. But I want to point out uh, this a little bit and say, OK, here is when you start drawing, you actually have time to understand the space. What you see here is different type of mullions. I mean, which architect would just take, oh, I found two windows. They maybe don't fit there, but I'm going to place these windows there because I have them. But notice what happened down here. He closes everything, right? So remember, this, is, this was boarded off. This looks like a four by eight sheet of plywood. There is some corrugated iron. There are windows, a different door, different heights. He goes to all the trouble to adjust them. And in my mind, it's simply because he sees what he does with light. And I go into this. So what happens, actually, he took the bathroom out on the upstairs. Downstairs has two bedrooms for his children. And the bathroom is actually to the side. All new plumbing and just out of it. It becomes a vessel of light. You go up that central staircase. And it kind of acts like a church sculpture in my mind. So the windows that are flooding the light in here, they go all down into the central staircase. And then it basically defines very clearly the outline of it. And also it's very important to judge. It has actually placed a rectangular uh, horizontal ceiling. By the way, what you see here is a native Navajo pottery. And what you see is it's probably here where the bathroom was or something. And you just left this as is, so where the walls won't stood, you can actually see them. So in our drawings, what we did in the book, we always showed the box and the understanding of it, because the clarity of all that comes really only through, through this particular way of drawing, which is all through projections, when you can then do the proportions. Because if you would make isonometrics, it would work somewhat, perspective certainly not. But the way we decided to make elevation plans and sections is so you can actually reconstruct in your head the proportions of all that. So what I was fascinated is that he was one of the early American adaptive reuse adopters of industrial building, which he started in the 68 Soho loft. And here is where the bathroom is. He literally put it outside, new building, new plumbing. So the inconvenience is that when you need to go to the bathroom, you have to go outside of the building. And we all know the example by Tadao Mando uh, in architecture. But here I make a comparison between Judd's minimalism, which I think is so much and so often misunderstood. So I want you to notice you're inside here and you look at the range here. It's a simple gas stove, which maybe in some of your houses you grew up in 
to the back there is a simple refrigerator so really nothing particular and everything is open shelves so John Parson is an architect who greatly admires church and has written about it how much he admires church but here is this his architecture so of the minimalism we actually understand in architecture everything is recessed right and this I have never seen this sink in person it's out of all my book but it always like like these airport things right you ever had the hand underneath there and then you wouldn't come with the water and then you took it away and then it finally came it really looks very nice very minimal but that's not what chat is about but people like John Carlson make all the time reference to that and we know that this way of construction is actually quite costly nothing against it but in terms of the reference I'm not sure what's understood this one similar the architecture of Tadao London no open shelf just an opening where the counter is um, no handle nothing and the thing most outdated is the furniture right the photograph from the 80s those of you who go back there and know the memories and, uh, the architecture still looks kind of it holds up I'm not sure about the furniture architecture the first publication who didn't came back with the first publication soon for published was a very small book in actually I believe in English only it was a lecture he gave at Sciarc and the second page was an artwork by Don Church he referred to so when he came to Marfa he really felt like he wanted to have the size he was tired of having these gallery shows and that the work in itself he felt like the placement is as important as the work itself now we just talked about sort of what we call tectonics of construction according to center this is a detail of his uh, milled aluminum pieces in Marfa so over the years Chad's precision of producing architecture is not unlike from an architecture firm starting out and then refining their details through their career I mean the precision is exquisite and you have to imagine this is done before really everything was done and drawn with computers so here is just to show you how we basically place the artwork and then the cone is basically the cone of vision and it shows the work how this is placed in the space because it was so important to Jeff. A question of preservation and also some logical moves there so this is where you saw actually the, the chimney going out was that chimney out there he called that the winter bedroom and then I'm going literally for 25 years to Marfa now and what happens is like some people say no no it's not the winter bedroom they gave in different names and there's an argument about that but what I want to point out is like of course you want a space which you have to heat less and I have nobody to explain how cold it can get in the winter even in Arizona so um, the spaces itself uh, the library there are 13,000 books and this is before the internet so it was just about his passing and maybe it was out there but not as it is nowadays so 13,000 books the furniture is designed out of raw off-the-shelf lumber from the lumber yard and the wood is untreated and notched uh, see it right here uh, he actually organized the library himself according to themes uh, he had multiple copies of several books I visited all three ranches which I will finish this lecture today but in all three ranches you actually find uh, at least in two ranches and in the main library I would find a copy of uh, Vitruvius's 10 books on architecture so it's incredible to see how he actually divides the space and the space in itself and again what I pointed out that clear story light is a theme he created in the two-story house but then basically comes out in anything with large ceiling heights such as the hangars or now here in the library so this narrowing opening up of space uh, is, is really fundamental for Jeff this is what I call my most favorite room in Marfa if you see this piece here um, this actually is the third variation of his first piece when he instead of had it at the wall he put it onto the floor the original first version is actually of all places 
in Basel, Switzerland, in the Kunstmuseum. This is his seminar show in 75, the same time when he actually made that movie clip like that. And this is in the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. So, not surprisingly, this looks a little bit like 70s architecture. Now, take your pick. Which light do you prefer? Spacing done in collaboration with Chad. But how do you arrange a piece of artwork? Here is again that, that uh, 1962 piece. And then his desire also for having a piece of furniture within the space when you're looking at it. This is a Gustav Stickley bench. And the bench and the furniture, and I'm told I wasn't there, but this was all in use. So what I'm trying to say here is actually that in order to progress, when you look, and you can never observe, uh, the best way to observe that is literally in Marco, that actually it progresses as quality, as he goes, the quality in the craftsmanship of the work improves, because on, not unlike like an architect, he redesigns the detail and finds better solution each time. This marks a shift for those of you who have not been to Marfa. Is you cannot just go and say, "Oh, well, you know, I want to go see the Chert Museum." Well, you can, of course, but there are two foundations. And in 1987, he uh, founded the, the, what's called now the Chinadi Foundation. And in my publication, you can actually see each work is keyed that way. And to first come to Marfa, sometimes that's confusing. But the interesting thing here is sort of what I think on that poster, which is a collaboration with um, Joseph Albers and using that font. And, but also, what I, I don't want to really point that out as much. The colors, black and red, yes. But I want to specifically point out that it's dual language. So in 1987, he always published anything coming out, the newsletter or from Chinadi Foundation in two languages, because that's the area he was in, and he felt he wanted to refer and represent. So now we are the first, I should have mentioned that, the first building, the block, is owned and maintained by the Jet Foundation. And uh, what we now go, we go to the grounds of the Chinati Foundation. If you ask me which foundation you should visit, uh, the only answer is you have to visit both to understand it. It's just that way. Both own about the same amount of structures of the same amount of importance, not the same numbers, but um, that. So when it comes to drawings, this is out of that first publication. Um, they're kind of not that good of architectural drawing. I would even argue that as a draftsman, I'm not that impressed with church. But what's important is what's behind it. And when it, now you will see some personal quotes of church. So um, this is the first work he started after actually he this came out, the Chinati Foundation came out, what's called the Dia Foundation. And when he basically uh, had a settlement with them and he created what's called the Chinati Foundation. So here, um, our drawing uh, from Texas Tech, this is the first drawing to my knowledge who points out the north, the true north-south axis of the 17 untitled works in concrete. And the reason why this is important this was before Google Earth when we made those drawings. And here it's simply indicated as a slight angle. It simply says uh, 17 works or 15 works in concrete. So, sorry. So we actually measured that exactly. And Judd himself in the lecture in Austin, he referred to, no, no, this is exactly perfectly uh, north-south. Sorry about the wrong number. But it's important what he says about the land, in my mind. So he actually places, this is a kilometer long, and you will see it. He places that work exactly on the north-south axis, but not only in the spot where he thinks it's north-south and I have the room to do that, but also he argued, this is where I'm not damaging the landscape. He never refers to his work as sculpture. And the first time I saw these, I said, well, you know, this is kind of architectural size. And I was immediately corrected by the foundation and say, no, you can't speak like that. But when you actually look at it, so we call it untitled, I have no problem with that. But when you actually look at it, in 
Europe, the regular room height is 242 meter point uh, four. And here, the entire unit's height is 2 meter 50. So it's really about like a space of a room. And when you actually go there and you look at the work, that's what you see. Um, over the years, I have seen Marfa getting drier and drier. Um, need to point out that this is um, the photography by Cameron Davidson. And it's kind of remarkable the way he photographed that particular piece. You can actually see even to maintain these pieces. Basically, you need to do the brush grazing and all that. The vehicle goes down. You can see that any traces or you do to the land in a desert is much harder to uh, overcome. And actually, Chad writes about it. Here you see actually the two hangers, and that's the golf ball, as I pointed out. And this from the last to the first is one kilometer or 0 0.67 miles apart. And I showed you the earlier stacks. It's kind of interesting what this looks like. So light, in my mind, is present, and every single decision Chad makes in the landscape as a whole, I write in the second paragraph of Don Chert architecture, I really write about the Gesamtkunstwerk, which is a German term for a uh, whole work of art, which means it includes the landscape, the way the landscape is played, the artwork, and the building in itself. So when you read actually this, this incredible destruction, this is literally, when it sounds a little bit funny, is because I'm presenting this for the very first time. I have lectured about Chet's work for some time, but in researching the natural light, it was just really interesting to go to the late Chet. He had about a year to live when he said that, is that the, basically the landscape and the place was so important. And this is an early undated photography of Chinadi uh, it's on their website. And can you see that this sort of a black and white, the kind of light that none of these structures are actually there. You can see some sort of drill field down here. But what I'm trying to point out, like in a very short amount of time, um, our settlement or the way we came across, you know, building these towns, they were really destructive of the land. And Chet notices that and the way it sort of scratched in there because of the age of the photography, it sort of shows that. The artillery shed is perhaps the most important art architectural work Chad ever completed. But I want to show you photographs you don't really see so much. So he doesn't really like bulldozers. So here is one. And I'm pretty sure Chad didn't took that picture himself. But you see the building here uh, with the original artillery doors. But then you look at this one. And I have a closer up on that, but this one is where Jeff makes a full size mock up and says, Okay, I don't know what this is going to be, but he goes through the trouble to make a full size mock up to see which proportions are right. Um, this is also out of the lecture. Um, I won't read it, but I, I would like to just um, refer to the bulldozer, which he sort of made fun of. You know, I mean, he was incredibly sensitive of it. Um, when he says towards the end, I think the land should be very carefully preserved and even as I will mention later to the point of having parks within the cities. So he was really looking, so this observing, the first thing is to do absolutely nothing is really what he held himself to. So here you go to the trouble making a full-size mock-up. You know, that's just a recent publication by a Rice professor Dave Dogeiser made a whole publication on mock-ups. I believe that needs to be in there. So when it comes to the proportions, just was just Chert was just about at every single time concerned. So all the doors are out. And then he actually talks about that grass because the grass here uh, in front of the artery shed, of course, that got damaged by doing the construction. And um, is two things. So the spaces are going across, as I will illustrate later, they're actually incomplete as they are right now. At the end, there should have been two glass pieces to actually have 
a luminous space running lengthwise. This is what you find today, and that's that quant set hat added in this particular part here. That segment here should be actually translucent on the other side, so the light shoots across. And um, he saw actually the first sort of um, quant set hat here he first is building to, or where he found it was in Valentine, Texas. So this is how to experience it in my mind when you're not inside. So you look across the landscape, uh, through the grass, and then you see the sculpture or the pieces, as he would say. And then you see now why he has this thing simply quartered. One of his favorite proportions was proportion six to five, which he refers at some point, he found at Sant'Andrea uh, San by Alberti in Mantova. I double checked that and uh, it's true. Uh, same proportion actually used for the uh, size and format of my book. So here is what drawing can reveal. Um, the other thing needs to be pointed out. Um, Precision already talked about it, but this is where the art, the artwork is. He said he could have done an infinite amount of pieces. Of course, they're all about light, but he never really talks specifically about light. But when you go and look actually at how the works are placed, is that then the court division is actually unobstructive if you walk from the outside and look at it. And things I have never found out unless I started looking at it a bit closer. So it's 48 and 52 makes a total of 100. And he said he could have done an infinite number of pieces. When you enter the first one, Anytime you enter a room and just organize the work, you always have it very clear and you approach the work right there with you. Now look at this, this is not a symmetrical building. And he places, make sure that you're right approaching his work in the axis. And then you go into the main hall and there you shift it a bit. But you go, you're right directly confronted with the work. Look what happens here. This one is actually symmetrical, so he goes away from the ship and makes sure that when you come in, you actually approach the work right up front. So there is no question how and what things are clear and in any church building arranged with artwork. That's the case. I would even argue that's also the case when it comes to placing furniture. You may see that wall sort of being slightly skewed, which it is. Um, which makes me to point out he was ready to sort of forgive for things which weren't perfectly aligned. Um, and I like that about it, sort of the raw space. So when it comes to the proportion, you see a half and a half. That's carefully thought out. And then when it comes to the section, you see how the space is in these three rows, not unlike a basilica when you go down uh, the main nave and then the two side naves. And then that blue space, that segment in here, that should have been glass on both ends. Next time, for those of you who have been and you look at that, that, that really would complement the building. He wrote multiple times about that. So you cannot see it from one angle. You really have to understand Chet's work with the landscape, with the architecture, and the art itself. So I'm going to the only building at the Chinadi Foundation still, which is built actually um, through north-south axis. And I spend a little bit more time to explain about light. So this building um, served multiple purposes itself as a gymnasium for the army. And then later on, it served as a sort of uh, equestrian uh, facility for training. You see it in this particular undated photo, which I got from the Chinadi Foundation. Uh, numerous stacks, it was to at some point heated. You can actually see slightly the adobe actually showing through there. And this one is dated about 1981. You see this particular building, I want you to notice that having actually a roof, who was having the whole heating system for the arena what is called now. So that's what served that. And here it's already in the hands of Chad. This is what it is today. On this uh, concrete area, you actually have a 
uh, work by Richard Long artwork. But I want to show you what happens here. So um, in my mind, this is one of the best building because you actually can use it for purposes. And the College of Architecture, together with ACSA, actually rented it in 2017 for our keynote. I'll get into that later. But this is the loft space. So here he has two existing openings who were windows before. And he makes a desk uh, completely oriented south. And there is your bed, which basically is a mattress, and then that's a piece of art by David Rabinovich. There are two pieces of art by him. And I'm doing the same thing a little bit what I did in the blog. So I don't know exactly why these walls were the way they are here, but Chert decided to fill it up, except in two spaces, and create an open courtyard. And that's what it is today. This is during the construction. And actually, this is one of the spaces you can experience. This is Judd has his open house in the fall, always second weekend uh, in October. And he felt like if somebody travels to Marfa, uh, we have to uh, celebrate that. And this is where I'm celebrating with my friends. But also, I invite the Marfans and people, friend from far, and we look at art and talk about art. And nowadays, the foundations are using it for still in this spirit, but also as a fundraiser. Um, this is the, should I point that out? That's actually here, that's the former um, uh, heating house, which now is a bath. You can see the two faucets here to the left and you step into a, an open bath there. So here is sort of that light vessel I talked to you about and I want to make that the center of what I think Chad had in mind when he came to architecture. Often when we do as architects we make carefully sure that things align or when we close walls that the walls are aligned. What he found with the arena is actually that there was a lot of dirt in there. He took the dirt out and he found the stripes foundation where they actually had the wooden floor going this way. And at both ends, he filled it in with concrete so he actually can use the space for events as it was intended. And this is the filled up space. This already existed and all these stripes were there. That's the other work by Rabinovich. So when you actually come there, it's now also rented out to weddings. It's amazing in my mind of what you do with the space when you don't have the most amount of money, yet you want to make an effect. And I show you a little bit before and after picture where you can see that. So this is the arena in about 1958. So nobody thinks we're only going to have a high-end uh, keynote in here. You also see that these windows here are kind of smart in my mind, you know, like when the heat is above, you know, you have it for ventilation, it goes out. But all these lower building windows, this is all walled in by church. There is a regular door. And have a note here about the height. So the dirt is in there and the foundation is actually underneath. And this is a bit of speculation, but I think that's the corner we are looking at. <laughs> And this is the little cow who just about gets scared. So when you actually punctuate that, and on the other hand, I photographed this over the years. So this is the other piece by David Rabinovich. So the way the light condition changed, and the only thing is really you have these light bulbs up here, which is all you get for your natural light. But the entire space, the way it is articulated, the way the different structure is, the textures of the floors, leaving the existing foundations for the, um, uh, when it was a gymnasium in there, but actually filling it with gravel is the power of this building. And then you see people doing, you know, like things, right? I mean, you can, they don't tell you you have to walk on the stripe, but this gentleman, that's what he does. Um, this actually is from Chinadi's website here. Should have mentioned that. 
You might recognize someone on here, but this is what we used. I was co-chair of the ACSA conference. This is Stephen Hall getting into the building. And there you see, okay, this is also a slight criticism. So you see the same opening, of course, it's, it's a magical moment of the conference, I really must say. But guess what is this? Any architect would actually know. Well, this is a handicapped ramp, right? I doubt it even has the right appropriate level, but of course it wasn't approved by a building commission. He just did it because he felt that way. Now, with the visitors coming in, this is basically your professorial, as we have it, is almost now there. But when I photographed it during the years, you know, this is the first time I saw that. So, but it actually works remarkably well. I just also want to show you a space. Uh, when it actually is being used, and I think sometimes when we think of the architecture of Pawson, I think we should rethink how we might use the dilapidated space and the lecture itself there, um, Paul lecturing, uh, was literally one of the highlights there. So the only building actually of architectural value before Chert had it would be here to your right. These other buildings are also owned by Chert, the Chert Foundation, this to the south by the Chinati Foundation. But this is where actually um, I would recommend anybody to make sure that they visit the bank. Not so much for the bank, but just also for the content in there if you're interested in the architecture itself. So uh, the Marfa National Bank is still in Marfa and it's uh, literally a building which has remarkable little value. I think it's built in the 80s and has a drive through because people want the drive throughs First thing Judd does, uh, one of the first things is, you know, among other things, he takes out the ceiling inside to make sure that the lights can be accessed again. So another uh, homage to the light and the natural light in there. So I'm told, I've never seen this, but there was a whole suspended uh, ceiling in there in order to actually have the air conditioning in there. This is a painting by the architect. You may notice those two Frank Lloyd Wright stained window glasses and the sort of other part, the eclectic collection. So it's, Chet has no issues to have a design of his and then an antique piece he liked to have it there. So early paintings before he moves really to his floor pieces. And literally the only idea I ever had at that point about sort of as a joke is like, well, you know, nobody made drawings, so why don't we make it? So measure it. Um, he researched actually that was repainted. He researched that the paint is sort of that slight yellow you see here. But I would say it has faded, especially the last time I was in there. Um, these are the drawings showing the proportions again. And then the remarkable piece of furniture. These are actually original period pieces. Uh, Mies van der Rohe, of course, as you can recognize, but also those are actually not just any pieces, they're out of the collection by Lily Reich. And those of you who know, uh, close associate with Mies himself. And then here you can actually see a courtyard hand sketch of Mies, one of the two uh, we photographed here. So the combination and positioning, this is what's referred as the architectural studio so this is where the furniture and the projects are handled uh, in their early prototypical pieces by Rikeri Riedfeld and then uh, furniture pieces produced in Switzerland um, here to the forefront that's a great chair and a Joseph Albers here in the back so we had 20 years time and he never really talked about uh, light or natural light. But in, um, I believe in 1993, he wrote one of his last major essays called uh, uh, About Colors and Red and Black in particular. So that time he actually lectured at Yale School of Architecture. He lectured for the um, landscape architects in Houston. 
and he also had a lecture at the Kimbo. So we know he referred um, Louis Kahn, but I think if he would get a nod, he probably would give it to Mies van der Rohe. However, I don't think he would have bought in sort of the metaphysical conversation Louis Kahn had when he says, well, you know, the brick wants to be an arc and that type of thing, or what the light does. For him, or that's what I came to believe, is for Judd, the light was a given. And to him, it was just part of, also I might say a bit, his, his skill, you know, like you, you can architect ask and have conversation with architects all day. Well, why do you design the way you do? Especially famous, notable architects, they maybe say you or give you a suggestion, but they don't precisely tell you why and how, because then everybody would do it. So there's also a certain secrecy. So if you drive this road down, uh, it's Farm Road 2832, I believe, and this goes out of Marfa, it's paved, uh, high desert, grassland, and for 32 miles it's paved, and then you come to this after it is basically a one lane road on gravel. So this is the um, Rimrock or the escarpment there, and this is when you go down Pinto Canyon Road. So a stretch of about 20 so miles until you're at the border of the Rio Grande. But what is one of the more spectacular scenery? So if I say do I have a choice to go to the National Big Bend or do I go down Pinto Canyon Road, I'm inclined to choose Pinto Canyon Road because it's really, really remote. And it is, in my mind, uh, less traveled because ideally you have a four-wheel drive vehicle. But what I'm pointing out here is that you're actually going to see three of Judd's ranches. And he called them all the ranch, all is called what's called uh, Ayala de Chinari. And I should have pointed that out before. So with, uh, with his architecture, he gets to great detail, give them names, sometimes even complicated names. You can call, okay, the um, two-story building, well, that gets to his function. But the artillery sheds, that's the former function. So my argument that the late Chad is actually think, thinking different, very different of the architecture than, uh, of, than his thought of his art, where he basically wanted to come like the phoenix out of the ashes and say, okay, there's no history, I'm the inventor. Sort of a modernist of approach that basically I'm the creator of something new, which has not been done before, but with architecture, he always referred to the previous owner. So this is the first ranch Chet bought. Uh, it's called Gaza Morales. And there's literally no road to it. You actually go up a uh, creek bed when it's dry. And Morales is simply the first owner of the ranch. If it looks dry to you, it is really dry. And uh, people actually trying to make a living there, um, they didn't last that long. Old Pinto Canyon, it even had a schoolhouse at some point. But uh, Juan Morales, who originally owned this uh, in the 40s, I think he did not have many large farm animals, but mostly goats. But what you see here, it started out as a one room house. What is remarkable to me is that Chet finds it important that we have to um, preserve that history. And when you start looking at it, as a one-room house, he actually creates a perimeter. He has about 40 drawings for additions in other gardens. But this is what was realized. There is no electricity, and there is only um, cold water from the stock tank. So I'm trying to show you this plan here. It started out as a one-room house, and then these two rooms were added. And the bathroom was also added later. So often people say, oh, well, you know, like Judd went there because so he could do large artwork. I think that's not the whole story. I really think he didn't really create it, care so much about just the size. Otherwise, he would not have had an interest in Casa Morales. And this is actually a trough for the animals for food. The original porch had 10 columns. For whatever reasons, he decided that's not the proportions I like. And he made it six, uh, five columns with four bays. 
And uh, as I say always to my students, I mean, my students in West Texas, one of what a Texas architect has to learn is how to create space. But this is sort of the remarkable thing, you know, anytime you enter into a church space, that's what he did, you know, he added that pine cladding there, and it just makes that tiny space all of a sudden when you step in there looking majestic. You see the two faucets here, that's only for cold water. This is actually what's called an ice box. So you would bring ice and you fill it in on the top and below you bring in the goods. There's three total stoves for this relatively small space. And that's where you cook. So kind of interesting. The other interesting part is when you look here, these particular chairs, I always say, Chert never threw anything away in his entire life. But before he moved to Spring Street in New York, these tables you can see in the photograph in his apartment at 19th Street. But the space in itself, so knowing in there, this is also something probably most architects wouldn't do because, oh, we have to cross space that, right? And he simply makes this cladded space, which is the entire quality of the Casa Morales. And that's called the Tendi, ten, Tendieta, and you have some outdoor kitchen things there, and then he makes a counter around, which allows you to basically have your uh, morning toilet right here and looking out into the landscape. Uh, I think it's one of the more uh, beautiful place structures in of all the uh, church spaces within the land. So I'm trying to, should have said that earlier also, with the telegraph, he actually is referring to the land, not really to Marfa or a city. So Casa Morales, he bought three years after he bought the block in 1976, that's the first ranch house he purchased. So my argument is also that church is as much interested or even more in the land than he is as what we now think in Marfa. It's just still very difficult to access that. If you ask Chert Foundation who takes care of those ranches, you can access one ranch, Casa Perez, which I'm going to show you. If you drive through Pinto Canyon, you can actually see Casa Perez right here. This is the one with the easiest accessible because it comes down Pinto Canyon Road, which is a county road, and then um, Jet Foundation actually opens it up for uh, star viewing events and ranch days. Uh, most of the time, this is now dry. This is where Quinto, Pinto Canyon Creek would be. And this is, to me, the most interesting landscape formation I found in terms of location of the ranches. Uh, it goes really quite steep up. So that's what we decided to do in presenting the two additional chapters of the new edition to actually show the contours of the landscape. And then the range, which is sort of on the plateau, the Casa Perez Ranch House, and just adding these three structures. This one is a combination of it. This is actually storage and bathroom. And this is the existing house, and it's actually not really a remarkable house. But the way Chert treated it from the inside, it becomes quite special because it actually has the tallest ceiling height of any of his ranches. Um, also, this is the one functional tank he has, and he designed a, ser designed a series of platforms. Um, you really can't go on there on your own. You have to go there uh, with the Chert Foundation accompanying you. Uh, and it's remarkable once you start seeing it how difficult it is to get there you have to imagine to maintain these buildings it's quite an effort and i want to say that both foundation did a remarkable job over the last two decades to do that as you can see from the weather i've been there multiple times um, this is the original orientation and unlike morales this actually is sort of down into the valley and the way he sort of opens it up, this is a garden designed by Judd, and then this ends the perimeter of that plateau with the rectangular tank. And you can see that all these things are oriented the same direction. And here is these three platforms I just pointed out. So in a way, when you look at it in the drawings, you all of a sudden can put the puzzle together of how this is looked at. And as I said, to produce shade, uh, that's something an architect in West Texas definitely has to learn. 
Um, those of you who actually look at that tectonic of the sort of sagging thing, the um, structure is um, protected by linseed oil, and that's personally told by me by the maintenance person who brought me there. But I also know about wood, you know, ideally you would do it on both sides, and I think that's part of the bowling which happens here. Uh, but also look at the grass, I mean, how a tough time it has to grow. This is about in June of 2016 when we were there. So the space is very simple, uh, two quartered rooms. I speculate that this particular area where the kitchen is was actually an open porch area. I wasn't able to verify that. But here again, Judd does what I think is kind of a smart move. When you come in, you put anything plumbing, which he already did on the block, he put that outside, so he doesn't have to go to the existing house doing that. And this is actually a pantry storage here, but that's a um, bathroom there. So this is that very interesting uh, hill formation there. I mean, it's uh, the landscape to look at it and how you actually look and perceive the outdoor spaces uh, is done with great care. And this is actually the most remote branch. It's called Las Casas. So he did not um, name this ranch, but actually he is buried nearby. He didn't mention uh, name, name them after uh, the persons or persons who lived there. And here it is in the distance. So it actually has spent almost a week there measuring uh, this in 2015, going there actually uh, with the for service work which they had to do in the spring break of 2015. But to me, this is actually quite important. When you start to uh, see why did he name it, and I only recently found this because, as I said, this was this again from the lecture, and he's actually also talking about. Um, Bartolome de las Casas, and, and many of you who have uh, more knowledge, I must admit I'm not an expert when it comes to indigenous population of the United States, but it actually shows um, that he was quite aware, so his 13,000 books in his library, he was an incredibly well-educated person, and then felt like, okay, um, this person actually tried at least at some point to uh, counter way of what Anglos, but also uh, the, the Hispanic, the Anglos to the north and the French to the south. So basically European invention did to the population. And I think it's also going back that when I said that in 87, when he um, has it uh, Bilingual is actually to acknowledge both cultures now being in Marfa um, and in that particular Big Bend area. So again, here the modification, this is unfinished. This is the largest ranch complex. So this is the main ranch house here. This is the only new building. It's referred to as the bunkhouse. And this is what actually again separated this. This is where the bathroom and the kitchen is. So again, the functions are separated. And here is um, the artist studio. Artwork is in there. And this is a, a Corrales out of um, Volcano Rock. And these are unfinished buildings. They are for range equipment and other structures. And there's a lot of talk by the Judd Foundation. Now we should complete this. Um, uh, it reminds me a little bit then when, you know, like Corbusier died abruptly and uh, Mario Botta actually was involved on the project of Venice, should be finished it, and he worked with De La Fuente on the, on the uh, Venice project, and of course they didn't finish it. And I think it has to do with several architects who sort of surprisingly passed away. I'm a little bit similar, I'm not sure if they should be completed, um, Church Foundation thinks so. Um, I just want to say again about the landscape. This is an irrigation garden here and actually has irrigation spigots. Here, the trees you see dotted and it's lined in the book. But actually, olive trees he brought to the site. So, the idea that it would be just about architecture, that's not the case. It was always about what I refer to as the Gesamtkunstwerk. 
the best way to again understand this in my mind is the existing water tank, but that you see that the ranch house, the original ranch house is actually the smallest space when you look at the space in itself. It has not to do about size in my mind when it comes to it. So this is the existing corrales and then these three buildings, uh, walls project, I simply called it unfinished in the legend. And these are the olive trees and this very shallow retaining wall he put in. It's really a separation of how the terrain works in a very incredibly sensitive way. And uh, it's actually difficult to access it. So when you're from Marfa, it's only about uh, probably less than 60 miles to go there, but it takes you three hours to actually go there. I should have said that originally at the time of his passing, he owned over 40,000 acres of land and the three ranch houses. So the last chain you see here, that's Mexico already. And in my mind, that that's the opinion of uh, Flavinger, his son. He basically said he would have moved. Actually, I was kind of a little bit fed up for various reasons with Marfa when he, around the time of the early 90s, and that he really was pushing the ranch projects and considered to live more permanently in one of the ranches because of the feed mill next door where he was um, uh, yeah, often irritated about the noise. Now you see the volcanic rock here and you see actually the careful uh, stonework which, which basically happened and I find the walls even though they're now not architecture, they're intended as architecture, they are unfinished, but in a way I, I just feel to me that they should be left as is. Here again, the simple proportion, it's a half and a half. And of course he saw that, so the existing corrales is based and then just doubled and then lined up. And I must say, I can't find a space in Judd's work where I think um, he's proportionally off or something seems awkward. Even if a piece of artwork is small or the ranch space is small, it somehow always have a feel, has a feel of grandeur. Uh, here that's the low circle and these actually we did measure those spigots here though these are individual uh, faucets uh, you can turn on and uh, have the irrigation garden. Uh, this is actually Chinadi Mountain, Sierra Padra and Chinadi Mountain in the background. So you see the room height again, the same clarity of the box as I described it, and the porch added by church. So relatively small building, but in all my mind, a preserved building, and thankfully so. So um, this is the last quote that basically I want to show you. Uh, in my mind, uh, Jared looked as architecture as more like an archaeological situation but also geographical situation so that for him it had to be looked at that and it had to be looked at it with care so the idea that he would why he wouldn't write about light he maybe would have would he have had more time to live because when i showed you the photograph by laura wilson he literally had three months to live and everything sort of came to a halt. I uh, should have also mentioned he never made it back to Marfa. So that's the last picture taken. And he went to see and visit his parents who lived in Missouri at the time. And the interesting thing is, you know, he thought he, he uh, comes back as a healthy man. He went to Europe, he gave the color essay of black and red in particular, and then came back to Spring Street and ultimately died in a New York hospital. So the here and now is another idea which I think he very much lived as a person. But I think in architecture there's still a lot to discover. And I think in my mind, sort of looking at it, of what's preserved now out there, thanks to him is, I think, where we all can actually have a lesson for all of us uh, in one way or another. So thank you for your attention. I'd be glad to take some questions. I think it's roughly plus or minus an hour, but uh, this is what I have. have. Thank you.
thank you once more. Looks like that was, that was inspirational. And thank you again for the mentorship that you've led here with Peter as well, so you get to benefit from him on a daily basis. Um, we have some time for some questions. So does anybody have uh, any questions? Thanks for that fantastic talk. Um, I'll confess that I have not read your book yet. So you might have addressed this in your book, but not in your talk today. And that is, um, I'm wondering what you can perhaps share about this interest in natural light in his work, in his architectural work, and the intersection of that with the work of his collaborator, his brief collaborator, partner, I don't know, Loretta Venturelli, yes. who was watercolors who were very much about light. Yes. Uh, thank you for that question. I actually uh, refer to Loretta's Venturelli work, uh, for those of you who don't know, she actually was a partner with Donald Church for about a decade. And a very important dissertation was written. Um, uh, after my first edition, so I'm addressing the ranch work, especially in Morales, she had a significant influence in there. And in the terms of the watercolor, I must say I haven't written about it, I always saw it more when it came to the idea of prints and the idea of color there, because that seemed to be clearly an influence. I should have also mentioned that Church's earliest reference to a courtyard house, which Loretta Vincarelli actually writes about and makes her architecture in watercolor, is actually later. And Church's first series of courtyard houses, they're actually for Baja California. And he has a series of courtyards now. So he also had, of all things, a sister who lived in Lubbock. And uh, he writes in Horti Conclusi, and I think it's also earlier than Loretta's work. And he, he doesn't make a drawing, but he says, Well, I, I told my sister in Lubbock uh, that in the block of land she has, she should put a wall around very of the land. And uh, he actually is precise, he says about the fantasy and new block wall. Of course, he couldn't even do that then because he had to have a set back of 25 foot. So um, there is a lot still to discover uh, that I, the influence is absolutely there. Um, there are also drawings credited to uh, Loretta, which are actually part of that particular range. And when I asked for the drawing for Casa Morales, um, he was called with first place, and somehow uh, Jet Foundation didn't have yet catalogued him. So there is a lot more to come, um, as it all is, right? I mean, um, I would say if I was going to my work, I could tell you where I borrowed from Jet. And I think there is a lot more to discover in that regard. I, I would say that the Taking a part part, I think the tectonic part, church with the concrete buildings just didn't have that knowledge, you know, unfinished building. And I think Loretta, when she worked with him, she didn't have that component, was a component of the artwork. So I think it's a fusion in there and, 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 and uh, very more to like. Did he have other collaborators before the runner who were actually trained as architects? Not to my knowledge, but he considered himself that he wanted to study architecture. And then he simply said that he didn't study architecture because he didn't want to deal with the business of clients. So this is my theory. I haven't written about it, but I think he did. He thought all his life about architecture because he was like 12 credit hours short of an art history degree and he studied with Rudolf Wittkohler and Maya Shapiro at Columbia. And he didn't get the degree, but 12 credit short, he certainly had the knowledge. And if you look at especially Wittkohler's work on the Renaissance and the proportions and these famous diagrams, it's all about the big layout. And in my mind, he has 
told about Grace all his life. He was just a very private, shy person. And for many people beside him, uh, full disclosure, I never met Jeff. Uh, I came as soon as I could. But the first time I saw Martha was in 96, and he was already two years old. But um, the archives, the way they are now, they weren't accessible for the first edition. So there's now a lot more coming to light, but I kept the original essay where I sort of lay out why I think Judd's contribution in architectures are valid and different. And in my mind, it also is a very American way of looking at architecture because he is not as concerned what I learned with Mario Rota. Oh, well, you know, we're going to do this detail and that, and we're going to really make it costly and all that. And he just did it this raw space and put a nail in there. And this is now the problem for all the people to maintain that because, you know, it doesn't last at all. And his artwork is extremely fragile. So that's a very long answer. But um, the only time I'm mentioning is in the afterword, you know, in the, in, the, in the Morales chapter, is that because that's where I found the most prominent drawing of Loretta. And actually, it was shared with the foundation. So they're still, they're still categorizing, categorizing it. So if you go there, they, they don't have uh, every drawing in architecture and labels and names and water to. They're still a process drawing. Very good question. I have a, a question as well that was really just on my mind as, as you were showing this. And then at the end, when you said you owned over 40,000 acres of land, was how was he able to do all of this work? One, the labor to do the work that he was doing, and two, how was he able to kind of finance all of this project? Well, he, you have to imagine, I mean, it comes to Martha that photograph when he has his green coat on, he's world famous. I mean, he's 45 years of age, and he's a blue chip artist, as you would call it. And then, I didn't went into this talk, but this is really described in the book, in my mind, Chad operated like an architect because he didn't do his own artwork. You know, he made drawings and then somebody else produced the art. And in artists at that time, said, what? You didn't paint it then yourself? Right? I mean, it's something typically has to be the search of the architect. We never typically build, or the majority of us don't build our own buildings. We do design build, right? We design build. But most architects make drawings of buildings, as Robinelli said. And then somebody else said it. That concept immediately was clear for me. that well, you know, he makes that process of his facts and he refines it, and somebody else produces it. So the answer is, at the time of his passing, he had over 30 people working for him. So this condition that nobody wants to be in Marfa, that's why I showed you that clip. I mean, first of all, you see, this was in, filmed in September. It was green. It was way less dry than it is now. There was grassland, and what he did basically is nobody wanted this building for that very brief moment in time from 75 to about, uh, in already in the early 90s, he started picking up that nobody wanted to buy these buildings. So he actually had the world fame to produce these sculptures, which are numerous, and then put that money in there to everything was reinvested, basically. And there's many anecdotes about it at the time of his passing, very little money was in each foundation. And that's why it frankly feels so complicated. I mean, when you go there, the whole thing is trying to make it clear. It's so complicated. And it's difficult actually to preserve. So there are now these two foundations who are about the same, really the same importance. You can't say it goes to this or it goes to that, but anything he had, he put into uh, that. He had actually a house in Switzerland, which was given to him by a Swiss investor, and he modified it to his wishes. And same principle, but it has Swiss craftsmanship. Anytime he could get craftsmanship in architecture, he applied it. But he also understood the conflict. So the answer is, you know, like as a blue chip artist, which actually are very few when he was alive. And you saw the picture, that's how he walked around. I think he enjoyed very much also life. But he, he was in there for, for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Time for one or two more questions. Um, 
Was it not also that the relationship to artists of that time were very strong and the significance of this accumulated art collection another aspect of, of this really rich archive? Yes, you're right. You're Is right. really more a collector than. Well, I think the collecting may be a little bit misunderstood because um, when Jeff was alive, even he felt like, you know, like if you go back to the, that time period, you don't really look at minimalism. You look at, okay, the most important artist is actually Andy Warhol or Roy Lichtenstein. And these are the artists, you know, in popular culture. And he felt I was important as these guys. But of course, comparison, in comparison, Andy Warhol, I mean, he was almost a household name. While minimalism is an abstract thing, you, you didn't have to understand it that much. So the point I'm trying to make is, yes, he was known, but he wasn't quite that known for the artwork in terms of price. He was blue chip, but he wasn't as expensive. So the collection, he came together. He would never collect an Andy Warhol in his life. They have any exact same year. They both born in 28. So the point I'm trying to make, he had also then say, OK, I, I like Ronnie Hornsworth. She's known, but she's not that known. But besides the minimalism, didn't, couldn't you say it was very much a concept art and artists who were actually trying to outgrow the gallery? And that you would see much more in line with the land artist movement than with, with let's say, the, the pop art of the time and age? Um, yes, a little bit. But I also would say that the, you know, like when you look at Made for Heinz's work, it's just built for the millennium, right? I mean, the whole thing is sort of for a thousand years, you want to compete with the pyramids. And Judd's work, I think, it's not easily to put together in that box. I think it, it can, people always try to classify it. They try to classify it. Oh, okay, you're a minimalist, blah, blah, blah. And oh, by, I, I'm not fighting that, but what I'm saying, in my view of my research, I think Judd's work is far from that thing. I would say he's sort of the last person who was able to deal with multiple disciplines. But I wouldn't, uh, he, he definitely didn't refer to himself as an architect, but he knew that he did architecture. I mean, he was very sure about that. He even talked about it. But I mean, the way the selection is, or that group of minimalism, as Walter de Maria, uh, James Durrell, who is still around, uh, is, there are aspects of it, but even those concrete elements I showed at the beginning, they already went to a series of, of um, preservation. Actually, even those are extremely fragile. I mean, think about the nerve it takes to have a slab of concrete making sure it's horizontally thin. And as you know, it can snow here too. And then the, during the day, it, 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 um, it thawed and the rain goes right into the concrete. There's no foundation in there. I mean, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to secure them. So it is actually level. Uh, it's just, I would never do that because I would have, and I write about that, what I call a deformation professionnelle, which is in French of a deformation of the profession. Because I think like an architect, no, no, the red water needs to run off and all that. And it just does it. And then there are the shortcomings, like the, the concrete building, which I learned actually, and have also not written about that, but I talked to uh, Adrian Joles, who was a Swiss architect doing the work for him in Switzerland. He was actually asked by Jeff to come out to Marfa and do these architectural things. Because he started at the very end, realizing that he had shortcomings when he came to Blair Games, when he came to certain building types, and the built trade station in Basel, Basel he was involved. So I don't think that's the answer you were looking for, but it's so complex to me that certain things he does incredibly well, but when it comes to the tectonic aspects of the building, there are incredible shortcomings. And I would say even for the art, artwork, the concrete elements, the 15 ones out there, because even though they have sort of a uh, to me, uh, a linear stone hanger feel because they are a kind, you know, perfectly north south, the reinterpretation, if you want, they will never last as long because it's only concrete. So things are not in a tectonic way. How center would have thought it about it if they're not thought through.
a little tied to that question. So when he was designing, was he designing a place for people to experience his art, for, for art to live? Or was he designing a place for architects to also potentially experience the architecture? Good question. He was very conservative in the work architect or architecture, but it exists, unlike like natural light when I did my own thesis research. So the answer it is he definitely thought about it that people come to Marco to see artwork which is no longer to be removed. I should have said that also. So this is the largest collection of art permanently installed worldwide. So it's not meant ever to be removed. Did he meant that architecture come? Uh, I, I don't think he really cared because you couldn't control who comes, who doesn't come. But my appeal is what I try to express is like that somebody looks at architectural detail different than John Parson and actually can work in a place like the arena or the artery shed. Speaking of light, and that's an important part, I forgot that. There was actually electricity in the artery shed. <laughs> but you can go in there and look into the concrete columns, and he actually filled it with cement. Someone, not he himself, but they filled it with cement. So there is no, you cannot kick the light switch on. I mean, think about the museum. Then you cannot flick a light switch. You have to get the light which is there, whether it is cloudy, whether it is night. It's not a fabulous idea. <laughs> So it's the architecture of the art, and of course, you know, like it, it, you don't have to do the uh, exit sign there. Oh, by the way, did you notice every exit sign has been uh, put out of the book? Well, you can't notice it because they're still in my photography, but at, at, um, at uh, Spring Street, they asked me to, to actually, the my publisher, to actually Photoshop that out. And I actually didn't like that because I think, I mean, there's a fire stair, right? There's a fire stair right there, you have to be at it, so let's just show where that is. And this is a little bit how I look at it, you know, I could now go into there. So there's certain real shortcomings on that end, so I don't necessarily think he thought of anybody, he just thought it was important when it came to his artwork, or his, his work as a whole. But that's why the term Gesamtkunstwerk is the best term I can come up with. Okay, literal translation is a total work of art. And I use it in the second paragraph of my book. That's how I look at Marshall. I don't look at it as, art, as architecture. I, I also look at it as part of the landscape. But I have never heard him talking so much at the landscape as the late church. And in those transcripts, that's literally the first time that probably someone talks about that. So you get the first. <laughs> But then that's the interesting part for me, you know, it's like I'm, I do other things, but I'm still in, I'm still curious and learning new things, or at least I think I'm learning new things, maybe I just get older. Can I ask one, sorry. Of course. Can I ask one more question? Um, you studied his life and work so long, and been so immersed in it, and him being someone who has always evolved and changed. And that's speculation, of course, but do you think he would still be in Marfa if he was alive today, or do you think he would have moved on to me? Well, very good question. Um, and one answer I, I sort of get, but probably not precise enough, so apologize for it, but he did already try to develop both ranges, with all three ranges actually are unfinished. So making more, bringing more of his work there because, as I said, he kind of was tired with Marfa because of what happened there. Um, to the second part, he always traveled. I mean, always. The best way to illustrate that is if you look at the Orange Writing book who came out in 2016, because it always dates where he is. So it says Eichhofen, which is in the central part of Switzerland. And then he had a place in Germany, and then he had an exhibition in Japan, in Korea, and on the three righteous. And he writes it down all the time. So the amount of traveling in order to keep the jet operation going and producing a work, really like an architect, you know, he makes the drawings and then somebody builds it. That's that's what he did. So in my mind, I think he definitely would have been a polyglot, but you know, to have a library for one person with 13,000 books, I mean. I think I'm sort of one of the last generation who has a library. You know, I have 2,000 books that ask our students. You know, they look up on the list. Is it my phone? That's it. 
I mean, it's a whole different thing. I mean, it's a blank if anybody reads my book, Robert Hussle. I'm just saying it's blank. So, so this is this information part where what I'm saying is like, I can only speculate. I think he, I do think he had a special affination also because of the, like, you know, with the Impressionists, you say, oh, we went to the Provence when we did paintings and all that at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. I think he did that also for the Southwest. He definitely had that love for Southwest and the Mexico. And he says about why he chose um, Marfa and all that. It's all right. We just heard that in that clip. But where he would be, you know, like he, he traveled so art would be sold and museums would have shows. Um, I just would be really adding, I would be really curious what he would have done with those architectural projects like in Switzerland and others where he was involved with architects. Because I feel like I, I could have learned a lot. And maybe the best answer is sorry, that it feels like incomplete. I'm sorry, Claudia. Okay, thank you.